Will you pray with me once more before we begin? Father, we just pause now to acknowledge that the songs we've been singing and are true. Forgive us for forgetting that fact. We do ask your spirit to lead us now. to Speak to us through your word, which is living and active. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I ask you a question, uh, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but you can answer it uh, right where you sit. Do you believe in miracles? Oh, some of you like to answer that out loud. Do you believe in miracles? I don't, I don't mean like the 1980 hockey uh, team beating the Russians. I mean, do you believe that miracles are possible? It's a serious question. Do you believe in the miraculous? And do you believe that not just once upon a time they happened because the Bible says so, but that they can still happen today? And what do you mean by a miracle? I prayed for a parking spot, and I got the first one. It's a miracle, right? We joke around in my family about Christmas miracles at all seasons. I don't mean uh, coincidences. I mean undeniable supernatural events. It had to have been God. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Miracles. I highly recommend it to you. And in his book, he makes the point that Christianity is the only major world religion that requires miracles, where they're foundational. Other major world religions record miraculous events. Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Islam. They will record miraculous or supernatural things, but they're not central and foundational. The, the, the religions aren't built on these things. Christianity is unique in that way. In fact, it's built on two primary miracles. The incarnation, God of heaven and earth becoming flesh, and the resurrection, Jesus rising from the dead. Without those things, you don't have Christianity. You might have a religion that talks about Jesus kind of of your own making, but it's not Christianity, not historic Christianity. And all the miracles recorded in the New Testament, as we look at them, specifically and especially the healing miracles, are really pointing us to those two great miracles, the incarnation and the resurrection. Don't forget that. When you read through the New Testament, you read your Bible, and you come across healing miracles and stories, thank you. Let there be light. And there was light. Uh, when, when that happens to you, those miracles are really teaching us about the great miracle of God becoming flesh, dying on a cross, and rising from the grave. All, they're all themes of the miracle of our salvation, really, of what God intends to do in us through his son Jesus. So I want to read to you from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, the particular account, miraculous account we're going to look at together, and then we'll walk through it. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along or on the screen, Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd... Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Just reading that gets me excited to talk about all that's in there. In the Bible, sight is often a metaphor for belief, faith. Conversely, blindness is often a metaphor for unbelief or lack of faith. Let's talk about the context here because there's a lot going on in here. Uh, as he's leaving Jericho, Jesus and his disciples, and there's a crowd uh, with him or in the vicinity, presumably on the way up to Jerusalem because the next chapter, chapter 11, is about what we call the triumphal entry, beginning of Holy Week, right? Jesus enters into Jerusalem for the last time. The triumphal entry as, as King Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. At the end of that week, he'll be crucified. So this is right before that happens. This is the last miracle. This uh, and is the last miracle before the miracle of the, of, of the cross and resurrection itself that, that Mark records for us. The last account of healing. Now Jericho, by the way, is uh, it's about an eight-hour walk, 15 to 17 miles from Jericho 
to Jerusalem through some very rough terrain. Uh, Jericho is the oldest and lowest city on earth. Oldest in terms of continuously inhabited city. Over 10,000 years old. And it's over 800 feet below sea level. It's a pretty remarkable place. If you don't know much about your... Oh, look, it's already there. It's, it's a miracle. It's not. It's not. You see the red arrow there for Jericho. That's where Jericho is, not far from the Jordan River in the wilderness. In Jerusalem, to, the, to, its, to our left there, uh, but to the east, you have to walk... You're walking uphill. Uh, you go up... I think it's 17 miles long in terms of walk, and you ascend a couple of miles, in, or, uh, uh, not a couple of miles, you ascend about 2,000 feet in elevation. It's very rough. In fact, this is the very road, when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, or I mean the, 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 um, um, yeah, the Good Samaritan, excuse me, you know, the, the man who's walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, that parable, he's telling it about that, 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 that path, that road. Today it's called the Wadi Kelt. It's, uh, Arab, it's controlled by Palestinian Arabs, that, that region. My wife and I had the chance to be there. You'll see here a picture of Jericho. This is uh, Jericho today. It's known as in, then and now as the City of Palms. Can you tell why? This is, it's under Palestinian control, but it's in Israel. Um, you'll see the palm trees there, and then the far way out there, the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. It's, it's, it's literally in the, an oasis in the middle of the desert, fed by natural springs. The next uh, image here shows uh, Jericho looking, oop, there it was. It was there a moment ago. Looking from the palm groves up through the, through the mountains, that's the direction you would have to go to get to Jerusalem, through those mountains. It's literally in the middle of the desert, but it's, uh, it's an oasis. So, and in and, and Jesus' day, Jericho had two, two parts of the city, upper and lower Jericho. Upper Jericho, partway up that mountain pass, Herod the Great had built this massive summer palace because it's warm all year round because it's elevation in Jericho. This is a, a perfect place along that route underneath Herod's palace, the perfect place to beg from all the travelers coming and going into the city. All of them had to pass underneath Herod's palace, and that's very likely where blind Bartimaeus sets himself to beg. Notice that in the midst of the encounter between Bartimaeus and Jesus, Jesus asks a very interesting question. Do you hear the question he asks? What do you want me to do for you? Did you catch that? Now, if you know anything about Mark's gospel, you can flip back to two encounters before this. In the same chapter, chapter 10, James and John are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And they go to Jesus with a question, and Jesus says the exact same thing to them. What do you want me to do for you? And they say, give us positions of power in your kingdom. Let one of us sit on your right and one of us sit on your left. We want to be big deals when you finally come into your throne, Jesus. Bartimaeus has a very different request, doesn't he? What does Bartimaeus ask for? Mercy and sight. Here's two disciples, two followers of Jesus, who their question, Jesus says, how would you like, what if Jesus showed up in your life, visibly, audibly, showed up and said, what do you want me to do for you? Whoa, I have to think about that for a minute, right? We want positions of power, James and John say. This blind beggar says, I want you to have mercy on me and help me to see. Again, the metaphor for faith. I think it's instructive to us the two questions that are the two the questions that's asked the two requests that are given. What's the difference between James and John and, and blind Bartimaeus besides the fact that they have physical eyes and he can't see? Look at verse fifty-two. If you have your Bible, this is not on the screen, but turn to, in your Bible to Luke ten fifty-two for a minute. The last verse. And Jesus said to him, "Go your way. Your faith has made you well." What does he mean? Your faith has made you well. What is this faith that made him well? What is this faith that healed him that Jesus saw, pointed out, and responded to? The story in Mark 10 gives us a clear picture of authentic biblical faith. We say things in our culture like, have faith in yourself. Well, I know myself too well for that. We say things like, you know, have faith in the process, or just have faith. We don't, we don't really put any qualifier to it, do we? Just have faith in general. I think we, we, faith is a nebulous, sort of vague, unclear thing in, in our culture. But it's not so in the Bible. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence of those things not seen. Assurance and confidence, not a vague, undefined hope. In fact, Bartimaeus asked Jesus, 
for mercy and for sight. Jesus says, your faith, your confidence and your assurance of what you hope for has made you well. Now there's about six or seven verses in this whole story. So I think we've got about six points. You never heard a six-point sermon before? It's not twice as long, I promise you. It probably is actually shorter. The first one I want to mention to you. Faith sees without eyes. Faith sees without eyes. Verse 46, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. He could not see a thing, but he had faith. Think about that for just a minute. Humor me here. Close your eyes. Right where you sit, close your eyes. Now take your right hand and put them over your eyes. I want, them, I want it to be really dark. Try to block out the light that might be in the room. Everybody doing that? I'm doing it with you. Now imagine this is your life. Don't open them. Keep it pushed shut. Imagine this is how you live every day of your life. You can't see a thing. You'll never see the face of your wife or husband, your children, a sunrise, a Super Bowl. Okay, uncover your eyes. The total darkness he lives in. That's this man. Can't see a thing. Things we take for granted with our eyes all the time. I notice I'm going to have to get glasses soon. I'm doing a lot of this lately. But I still have sight. He lives in total darkness. But Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Faith, biblical, authentic, biblical faith, sees something. But it doesn't have any eye, without physical eyes, or not necessary for it. We believe that seeing is believing, right? Where's the ultimate example of this? I won't believe unless I see. Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas, a very unfortunate nickname for centuries. I have to see it to believe it. And Jesus, at the very end of that encounter, in John chapter 20, verse 29, says to Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet will believe. Who's he talking about? You and me. Faith sees without eyes. Jesus' response here is really remarkable. Second, faith focuses on Jesus. This sounds obvious, but if you, have nothing, if, if you want one distinguishing characteristic of biblical faith, it's this. Faith sees without eyes. It sees the eyes of the heart, Paul says in Ephesians. And what does it focus on with the eyes of the heart? Jesus. Biblical, authentic faith. Faith that Jesus sees and responds to focuses on him. This is the key distinction of biblical faith. So the object of your faith is not you. It's him. That's so important that you hear that. The object, the the power of, of biblical Christian faith is not the fact that you have faith. A tiny mustard seed, a tiny bit of faith in Jesus is far better than all the faith in the world in anything else. Did you hear that? The tiniest amount, the most feeble amount of faith in the right object, Jesus Christ, is far better than all the faith in the world in anyone or anything else. Mark says that Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming. He heard it was Jesus. I think, I I believe this to be true. I've talked to people that have lost certain senses, like the power of speech or or hearing or sight, that your other senses are heightened or increased. Johnny Erickson Tata writes about this uh, in in some of her writings. He hears. It's a crowd, a lot of noise. Maybe he asks, maybe someone tells him. Maybe he just hears amongst all the din of voices the name Jesus. Whatever the case, he hears that it's Jesus. Now, certainly, he had also heard about Jesus prior to this encounter, right? Because he seems to know something about this man. He calls out with a title and a request. He knows who this is. He's heard about this rabbi who can make the lame walk and even the blind see. Maybe he's heard about Jesus spitting on mud and wiping it on a man's eyes and making him see. Maybe he's heard about him cleansing a leper or making a paralyzed man get up and walk. We talked about those two stories recently. The rumors travel, and he sits by the roadside. He travelers come by. He's heard the stories, and he hears that this is Jesus. Now look at verse 47 again. I think it was just there, and it went away because I didn't read it to you. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Simple statement. There's a lot in there, though. When he says son of David, what's he talking about? Why would he say that? 
Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. Bar is the Hebrew prefix for son of. Timaeus is the word for honor, son of honor. His dad's name was Timaeus. Jesus, we're not told who, he, you don't know. He's the son of David. We don't know. David wasn't his father. His father was who? Well, his earthly adopted stepfather, adopted father was Joseph. What is he, why does he say son of David? This is a very specific messianic title. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, the prophecy to David's line. The Messiah will come. The throne will come out of your line. Here's this blind beggar who knows his Old Testament prophecies. He calls out, calling him Messiah by saying, son of David. The Messiah had to come from David's line. And then he says, have mercy on me. How many of you know uh, the, the, the phrase, Kyrie eleison? Heard that before? What, who is, the, is it Peter Gabriel who had that song called that? We sing it at high, in high church at times. It, Kyrie is the word for Lord. Eleison is have mercy. Lord, have mercy is what it translates to. That's what this man says. Jesus, son of David, Messiah, the one, have mercy on me. Authentic faith focuses on Jesus, and in turn, it sees its absolute desperate need for mercy. You cannot focus on Jesus and yourself at the same time. You cannot have your eyes on Jesus and who he is and all that he means and that he's all you need. You've seen that song, he's all we need. I don't need anything else. You can't have your eyes on that truth and on yourself at the same time. Contrast this again with um, James and John. What do you want me to do for you? Where do their eyes go? Not mercy, power, significance, prestige, self. So fa real authentic faith sees without eyes and it also focuses on Jesus. Third, it perseveres. Faith perseveres. Listen to verse 48. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. This is a simple little statement. There's so much here. This is persistent faith in the midst of opposition. Persistent, persevering faith in the middle of a culture, a society, people around who would be hostile to that faith. That's one of the hallmarks of Christian faith. It perseveres. It doesn't give up. It isn't discouraged easily because the environment in which it exists is hostile. Notice the crowds. Did you catch that? There's a large crowd. They're with Jesus. Where is Jesus going? From Jericho to where? Jerusalem, the holy city. Why? Triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. Passover. This is the time of Passover. The crowds are around him thinking, this is the Messiah, or at least it might be. He's going to Jerusalem. This is going to be good. We want to we be there. We want to be with him. This is big stuff. And here comes Jesus in the crowds, and this blind man says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they try to shut him up. Be quiet. Stay out of the way. Why? This is the king of kings. This is the Messiah. He doesn't have time for a blind beggar. We'll get to that guy later. We have more important things to do. They think they're honoring the significance of Jesus by shushing this guy and pushing him off to the side. They don't understand Jesus at all. Now, false faith. False faith, I, th I think, would be discouraged. Would be quiet. Well, maybe they're right. Maybe he doesn't have time for me. I mean, who am I after all? I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I mean, why would he stop for me? Maybe they're right. Who, who am I kidding? Who, who am I to, to, to think that God would have time for me? How many of you have ever thought that? Does he hear? Does he have time? Is he, is he, is he too busy for me? I'm a student in high school ministry many years ago in the movie... Jim Carrey was in called Bruce Almighty. I think it was Bruce. Was it Bruce or Evan Almighty? Uh, Bruce Almighty, the first one. You know, and he's got to answer all the emails and prayers come through his emails. And he puts yes to all, you know, just to save himself some time. And the whole world goes crazy. I had a student come and talk to me. And he was like, he, was, he basically, I wanted to know, does it like that? Is my, is my prayer request like an email queue waiting for God to get around to it? Is his inbox like my inbox, you know, jam full and I don't get back to people sometimes? No. Faith perseveres. They say, shut up, Bartimaeus. And what does he do? What does verse 48 say that he does? But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He shouts all the louder. He won't be dissuaded. 
God grows our faith, I think, often through opposition, often through difficulty, often in an environment where it's challenged, where you're caused to wonder, am I an idiot for believing this? I mean, is this just hocus pocus my parents taught me? Is this real? Did God, is it real? If you've never thought that, I think that you're in danger of not growing in your faith. You shouldn't be afraid of that. I think in the church sometimes we're too afraid of people's questions and doubts. We think you're losing your faith. Oh, no. If it's authentic, real, biblical faith, it will grow. It may be hard. It might be difficult for a while. You might feel weak. But I think God grows us through those things in hostile environments, in difficult challenges. Bartimaeus is surrounded by people who are telling him, don't go to Jesus. Don't ask that question. He's not interested in you. And he shouts all the more. Maybe we could ask the question, what causes you to second guess your faith? What causes you in your life to pull back and think, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe he isn't there. What causes you to second guess or back down on your faith? Perhaps God wants to use that very thing to grow your faith, to strengthen it, to deepen it. So faith sees without eyes, faith focuses on Jesus, faith perseveres. Next, faith causes Jesus to respond. I almost wanted to call this point, faith stops Jesus in his tracks. Look at verse 49. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. Notice how the crowd changes? Shut up, get up, right? Hey, it's your lucky day, he's calling you. Faith causes Jesus to respond. Faith, if you, if you like to highlight or underline your Bible and you have your, yours with you, you should underline that phrase in verse 49, and Jesus stopped. Think about it. A crowd all around him going to Jerusalem on a mission. He knows that he's beginning the journey that will take him to the cross. And a blind man on the side of the road calls out, have mercy on me, and he stops dead in his tracks. And he says, call him. Bring him here. Give me chills to think about that. Bartimaeus' humble cries of faith stop Jesus cold. Do you think he might stop for you? Do you think Jesus might stop to listen to you? I think he will. When you trust him. When you trust that he is who he said he is. When you persist. Do you ever wonder or doubt that Jesus hears you or has time for you? We talked about this. The poorest, simplest, humblest faith in the most, by the world standards, insignificant person matters infinitely to Jesus. Mother Teresa once said, to God there is nothing small. The moment we've given it to him, it becomes infinite. Because he is infinite. Sometimes we slip into thinking, um, well, you know, God cares about the big stuff about my life, but not the ordinary stuff that I'm all stressed out about. He cares about all of it. He cares about all of it. You don't need to be doing big, important things for God for him to have time or to listen or to stop for you. You don't need to uh, be living a, a relatively morally perfect life for him to listen. You don't need to have a certain level of Bible knowledge or get your theology right for him to listen or to stop for you. You simply need to call out to him sincerely. Jesus, I need you. It's really, isn't it beautiful? It's so tender. He's on his way and there's a big thing about to happen. And everyone around says, don't bother him. And Jesus stops cold. Next, so not only does Jesus respond to faith, faith calls Jesus to respond, but faith also responds to Jesus' call. It's a two, there's a two-way street of response, right? So genuine, authentic, biblical faith causes Jesus to respond to it, and then he calls, and then real faith responds to him. Let's read verse 50. Don't you like how we're going in order? Verse 50. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up, and came to Jesus. It's a simple sentence. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Jumps up, immediately goes to Jesus. Mark also says he threw off his cloak. Why does he include that detail? 
Mark's gospel is the simplest and shortest, written in the most common language, Greek. He doesn't, he doesn't use a lot of words and flowery expressions like John. Why would he include that? There's a reason. A cloak. By the way, in the Old Testament, uh, in Exodus 22, we're told the, the Old Testament law was that if somebody owed you money, you could not demand their cloak for that, from them. Because they would, that was like they were covering. You, they would freeze. You couldn't extract from them their cloak as payment. There's a law against that. Outer garment. For a poor beggar, the cloak was like a sleeping bag, a coat, beanbag chair, all rolled into one. It was everything. It was like his civil right in that culture. It was everything to him. It was easily his most prized possession. Assuming he's a homeless man. Maybe he had a home. There's a lot of ironic contrasts here, I think, in Mark. James and John contrast with Bartimaeus, their request and, and his. The crowds, who have physical eyes but can't see spiritually, right? And Bartimaeus, who has, can't see physically but does see spiritually. The rich young man, earlier in Mark chapter 10. Mark, 10, Mark chapter 10 is a study in contrast. The rich young man, right, who Jesus says, one thing you lack, go sell all you have and then come follow me. And what does the guy do? He goes away sad because he was a man of great wealth. Contrast that with Bartimaeus, throwing aside his most prized possession, all he had, his cloak, to come to Jesus. Unlike the rich young man, Bartimaeus was willing to cast aside that which he used to trust in. Think of, think of it that way. The thing he used to place his trust in to keep him warm, to provide for him, he throws aside because Jesus is calling. And that's a mark of authentic faith. You must cast aside the things you are trusting in or placing your trust in, your faith in, if you're going to come to Jesus. Doesn't mean you have to be, sell all your possessions. That was just that guy's hang up, the rich young man. Proverbs has something to say about, doesn't mean like we don't plan for the future, you should have no bank account, and you should never have any responsibilities for the future. Proverbs teaches something different about that. What it means is you don't trust in those things. Your faith is not in those things. It's not in your 401K. It's not in the, uh, the next uh, political regime for the betterment of the economy. It's not in the school system. It's not in the success of your children. It's not in you know, your retirement plan. That's not what your faith is in. And so you must be willing, at least in your heart, I I'll give that up. I'll cast it aside. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, who knew something about placing his trust in the wrong things, or his significance, or his self-worth, his faith, he talks about, uh, in Philippians 3 actually, his, his spiritual resume. A Hebrew of Hebrews, slain under Gamaliel, circumcised on the eighth day, which is a strange thing to brag about, but he brags about it, of the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, he gives his list of like why he would have been a big deal to the Jews. And he says, but all that stuff I consider rubbish. Some translations say Rubbish, some uh, say a refuse, some say filth. The Greek word is the word scubalone. It's literally the word for human excrement. It's a slang word, actually. I won't say it in church. But you all know think of it right now. I made you think it, that word. No English translator can bring himself to write it. Why is he saying? He's not saying it is that. He's saying compared to Christ, this is nothing to me. It's lower than low compared to Christ. So I will gladly cast it aside if I gain him. Why would I hold on to this when I can have him? If it comes to that, it's a no-brainer. That's real faith. Few of us get there. Bartimaeus does. Come wholly to Jesus. So faith sees without eyes. It focuses on Jesus, right? It persists. It responds to his call. Last Faith trusts and faith follows. Let's just look at these last couple of verses here, 51 and 52. Faith trusts and faith follows. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for, me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Again, blindness is a metaphor for lostness. Mark uses the Greek word sozo for made you well, healed, S-O-Z-O. -O. That's a word that also means, more frequently means salvation, saved. He doesn't use the Greek word iaome, which is the word for physical healing. He's telling us something there. 
There's more going on here than just the guy can see now. There's much more going on here. Remember I said at the beginning, all the physical miracles point to the greater miracle? They point to the miracle of the cross and the resurrection. It's a preview of what's to come. Notice the ESV, which is what we read from, says he recovered his sight. Can't be sure about this, but it seems like his sight was restored to him, some translations say. It's very likely this, this man, Bartimaeus, was not born blind, that he lost it in an accident, an injury, disease. Sometime years in his past, he lost his sight, and it's restored to him. This is a, it's a preview of what Jesus will do when he returns. All that has been lost because of sin will be restored. All that we had once in Genesis 1 and 2, and we lost from Genesis 3 onward, through sin, corruption, decay, disease, death, dying, all that will be restored and made right. All things made new. That's what this little healing is pointing to. And notice how it ends. He followed him on the way. Remember the beginning of the story in verse 46, that he's on the way, on the way. The text literally reads, there's Bartimaeus, like by the roadside, on the way, is the way the Greek actually reads. And, or in the way, excuse me. And then he follows him on the way. So he, Jesus meets this man, and real genuine faith takes you from being in the way, or off to the side, to being on the way. And by, and by the way, <laughs> The early Christians were called the way in the book of Acts. Bartimaeus, what's he going to do with himself now that he can see? Hey, thanks. This is great. How are you? I never knew what you looked like. Ooh, you're kind of ugly. He doesn't do any of that, right? What is he going to do with his sight now that he has sight? Follow Jesus. What else would he do? Where else would he go? He follows him on the way. And I've been thinking about this. A friend asked me before the service, what has God been teaching you lately? One of the things that occurred to me is, why does, why does Mark include his name? The rich young ruler, we don't know his name. The leper, we don't know his name. The paralytic, we don't know his name. The, we, we almost never get a name with someone that's healed in the New Testament. Why do we get his name? Why is Bartimaeus included? Son of honor is kind of an ironic name, isn't it, for a blind beggar? I'm speculating here. So it's not, the Bible doesn't say why you get his name. But I think I'm on steady ground to tell you this. I think we get his name because he followed him on the way. Meaning he's one of us now. He's a follower now. Perhaps when Mark wrote this, he's in the church of Jerusalem. Maybe he's a prominent member and a leader and people know him. Oh, that guy? That's his story? I've heard him tell his story. That's a beautiful story. He's named because he belongs to the family of God. He's not some obscure person in history. Think about that. He's a blind beggar, and his name is recorded for us throughout all of history. Why? Because of his faith. He called out to Jesus. He persisted in trusting in him. Stopped Jesus in his tracks because of his faith. And Jesus responded, and he responded to his call. And now we know his name. And here's the thing. When God gives you that kind of faith, he knows your name. Your name is written down for all of history. The Bible calls it the Lamb's Book of Life. He knows you by name if you'll trust him. Let's bow together as we close. Father, we thank you for this incredible ancient story. So simple and straightforward, yet there's so much there for us. We thank you that you have made all of us who have trusted in you to see with spiritual eyes. See ourselves and the world differently than we ever could have before. Help us to realize that we want to be like the blind beggar, asking you for mercy, asking you to open our eyes, trusting in you and persisting in our faith. Strengthen us, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.